Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bureaucracy Lecture. Today, we will discuss the purpose of the federal bureaucracy, how and why the institution has grown over time, structural limits, and end with a discussion on bureaucratic reform. By this point in the semester, you should be pretty familiar with what the bureaucracy actually is. The bottom line, the bureaucracy helps the president execute or implement the law. In fact, bureaucracy, with its French origins, bureaucracy literally means rule of the desk. But what exactly is a bureaucracy? What does it look like? And how is it different from other agencies or companies that provide goods? Well, basically, all commerce boils down to two fundamental motives. And this is important because this is going to come back at the very end of the lecture. These two motives are market-based motives or public goods motives. Remember during the first lectures of the semester, we talked about the differences between private goods and public goods. Private goods are rival and excludable, meaning that the market for that good is competitive and limited. So it's all the consumer status things that we buy, computers, phones, organic produce, Furbies, whatever. Public goods, on the other hand, are non-rival and non-excludable, meaning that consuming that good does not reduce its availability, like streetlights, sidewalks, or roads. Just because I use roads and sidewalks does not limit their availability to others. Public goods are available to everyone, and the government is generally in charge of providing these goods because they are deemed so essential to our day-to-day -day lives that we don't want competitive markets providing and competing for such necessities. Though this is basically the crux of libertarian political ideology, but we'll get back to more on that later. But this is where the bureaucracy steps in, to help organize the division of labor to provide these necessary and essential goods free from market competition. Let's think about it another way. I want you to picture your place of employment. Maybe you work at a restaurant or a grocery store or in retail. Now, as the employee, where are you allowed to park? Well, the correct answer is typically as far away from the front door as possible. Why is this? Because the best parking spots are reserved for the customer. And this is because market-based industries exist to serve the customer. But if you've ever interacted with the government, you know that they do not operate on the same basis of customer satisfaction. This is because the purpose of the bureaucracy is to implement policy, which means their top priority is satisfying those in charge, not necessarily the customer. So we already know how the bureaucracy is structured. We've talked about this throughout the Congress and presidency chapters. There are 15 executive departments headed by the president that are each charged with providing their own set of public goods. So from the Department of Agriculture to the Department of Veterans Affairs, these executive departments are responsible for making sure that laws that relate to their agencies are faithfully executed. There are three important characteristics of bureaucracies. First, bureaucracies are often managed by a hierarchy of authority. As you can see here in the organization chart of the U.S. Department of Education, for example, the chain of command is highly specified. Second, as we climb the chain of command, skills become more specialized with fewer workers who possess them at the top. Lastly, adherence to strict procedures and protocols is vital for the bureaucracy. Efficient bureaucracies are highly standardized so that the services can be provided consistently and fairly on a massive scale. One way that bureaucracies maintain such high levels of standardization is through an enormous amount of paperwork. For instance, maybe the situation has happened to you. You're at the DMV, you're waiting patiently to renew your driver's license, the clerk finally calls your number, you hand over all of your documents, and then you realize you've forgotten your birth certificate or some other obscure documentation they've requested. You plead with the clerk to make an exception just this one time, and you're probably met with the response, sir, if I made an exception for you, I'd have to make an exception for everyone. And considering that these government institutions have to serve the entire population, cutting corners is simply not an option. So this is why the bureaucracy often gets the reputation for being cold and rude. There's four areas of the bureaucracy that I'd like you to be aware of. First are the 15 executive cabinet departments, which we have already discussed at length in previous chapters. Remember, each department head or secretary is selected by the president with Senate confirmation. So there's a great example of checks and balances here. 
Each of the 15 executive departments also corresponds with specific congressional committees, which streamlines the process of writing laws and executing them. Second, independent agencies are organizations set up by Congress outside of the cabinet department structure. These agencies coordinate and carry out important government functions like the intelligence activities conducted by the CIA and the scientific research overseen by NASA. The heads of these agencies, known as administrators, are appointed by the president, but they generally report to Congress rather than the president. Third, independent regulatory commissions also report to Congress, but unlike independent agencies, these commissions are primarily responsible with regulatory issues like commerce, the environment, and elections. So the EPA is a good example. Finally, government corporations are unique as they charge money for providing public goods. So the US Postal Service and Amtrak are good examples of government corporations. Now, we've already talked about how the president is the head of the executive branch, and through his appointment of department heads and his ability to issue executive orders, the president really does have a great deal of power over the federal bureaucracy. And I just want to highlight an example which really captures the magnitude of this power. If you recall, during the 2016 campaign, then-candidate Donald Trump vowed that if he was elected, he would completely dismantle the Environmental Protection Agency and roll back regulations to help companies and factories grow in the United States. Though he has not yet followed through on this promise, President Trump has used his executive power to significantly weaken this regulatory commission. For example, the person he nominated to head the agency, Scott Pruitt, was described as, quote, a leading advocate against the EPA's activist agenda, according to his official bio on the website of the Oklahoma Office of the Attorney General. Before stepping into the role of EPA administrator, Attorney General Pruitt sued the EPA at least 14 times in an attempt to block environmental protections that might affect businesses in his home state of Oklahoma. And just again, I sincerely apologize for the people of Oklahoma for lots of reasons. Moreover, and again, I'm just directly quoting your book here, Pruitt also shared Trump's belief that climate change is not a threat. After his confirmation as EPA administrator in 2017, Pruitt called on the United States to cease its participation in the Paris Agreement. And in June of that year, President Trump announced his intention to formally withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement. In his time as the head of the EPA, Administrator Pruitt issued a rule to limit the scientific research the agency can use when writing environmental regulations, began the process of rolling back fuel efficiency standards aimed at curbing carbon emissions, and loosened regulatory standards on air and water pollution. The EPA also joined a number of other executive branch agencies in removing or reducing information about climate change on their websites. So under the Trump administration, EPA enforcement of environmental regulations has slowed considerably. The administration further proposed budget cuts for climate and clean energy programs in its budget proposals for both 2018 and 2019. Remember, based upon what the president's agenda is, he or she can make budgetary recommendations to the House of Representatives. But the proposed cuts for 2018 were largely ignored by Congress in their final budget bill. So you can see the incredible ripple effect that the president's ideology can have on how the entire government functions and operates. And while you might be thinking, couldn't Congress just pass a law instead that circumvented the president? And while, yes, this is true, keep in mind everything else that we've already talked about. When Congress is controlled by the same party as the president, it makes any deviation from the will of the president highly unlikely. So while Congress as a whole might have limited options to oppose the agenda of the president, at least in terms of bureaucratic oversight, individual policymakers can have significant influence when we consider the realm of the Iron Triangle. The Iron Triangle represents an alliance between congressmen, interest groups, and the bureaucracy. When these three entities work together, they have the power to produce policies and rules that benefit a very narrow segment of the population. For instance, when President Bill Clinton assumed office in 1993, he vowed to raise the fees imposed on cattle ranchers for grazing their livestock on public lands. 
Ranchers staunchly opposed the initiative, and their alliance with supporters in Congress and the Bureau of Land Management proved too powerful for the president to navigate, forcing him to abandon the proposal. Some argue that iron triangles obstruct the democratic process by benefiting narrow interest at the expense of public interest, while others maintain that they are consistent with democratic principles because people are represented through interest groups that act on their behalf. But really what this is capturing uh, is very similar to that represent.us video that we watched from the Congress lecture. The Iron Triangle becomes particularly impervious when you have super wealthy lobbyists asking Congress for favors, financing those same congressmen's re-election bids, and ending up with laws written by Congress at the behest of special interests. So this is that chain of corruption that the video was trying to highlight. So overall, I, I think my goal this semester has been to try to draw your attention to some of the major problems that are currently facing our government. And I think the Iron Triangle and the role of special interest and money in politics is a big one. And it's very well the most important problem that we need to fix first before we can expect any meaningful change in other areas of life and society. So let's go briefly through the history of what led to such massive expansion of the federal bureaucracy in the first place and discuss some popular ideas on how we can reform the bureaucracy to make it more efficient and representative. So there's five critical areas I'd like you to know regarding the growth of the federal bureaucracy. First, the election of Andrew Jackson in 1828. Two, the creation of the spoil system. Three, the reforms that were a part of the progressive era. Four, the Pendleton Act. And five, I wanna go over some key political eras that really defined the nature of the bureaucracy. First, let me tell you about my dude Andrew Jackson real quick. Jackson became the seventh president of the United States in 1829. You might know him from the 20. And he was incredibly popular because he ran on this platform of advancing the rights of the common man and dismantling what he called a corrupt aristocracy in the United States government. Now keep in mind, this is back in the early 1800s. So when Jackson says common man, he's really referring to poor whites. And prior to 1800, states required that men own property to be eligible to vote. So Jackson's election is really pivotal uh, because it was one of the first presidential elections in which non-property owning white males could vote for the president of the United States. So Jackson's strategy was to really advance the rights of these groups of people. The most influential way Jackson did this was by instituting the spoils or the patronage system, which was basically a system that handed out government positions in the bureaucracy to close friends, family, and supporters. And since it was Jackson's main goal to dismantle this corrupt aristocracy, he significantly expanded the size of the federal government and filled those positions with common man appointees. And this set a long precedent of presidents appointing individuals to high-level government positions who really weren't qualified to have the job in the first place. And this goes on for some 60 years until the American political landscape is hit with the reformist agenda of the progressive era. Now you'll recall, we've talked a lot about the progressive era throughout the semester. It played a major role in expanding voting rights for women, reforming the government, and ultimately the creation of the 17th Amendment, which allowed people to vote directly for their US senators. The progressive era also played a major role in dismantling the spoil system that was created by Jackson. So what was so wrong with the spoil system, you might be wondering? Well, let's just take a look at the impact the Industrial Revolution had on American society when this massive expansion of power, technology, and wealth went completely unregulated by the United States government. At first, you have the issue of child labor, which was a terribly dangerous environment. Children in coal mines were often chained or tethered to carts and coal mines, and they worked almost nonstop for hardly any pay. The progressive era was instrumental in passing child labor laws. Second, you have the significant health concerns with the meatpacking industry, not only regarding a complete lack of sanitation practices, but also the horrible exploitation of immigrant workers. If you've ever read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, you know how deplorable these working conditions were. Here's a short quote for measure. The meat would be shoveled into carts and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat even when he saw one. There were things that went into the sausage in comparison with which a poisoned rat was a tidbit. 
There was no place for the men to wash their hands before they ate dinner, and so they made a practice of washing them in the water that was to be ladled into the sausage. Yeah, so you can kind of start to see why uh, government regulation is kind of necessary. And so again, progressives ushered a wave of reforms like the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act in response. All of these reforms and many more were made possible by the passage of the Pendleton Act in 1883, which transitioned employment with the federal government from the spoils system to a meritocracy. So by ridding the bureaucratic system of political kickbacks and rewards, and instead granting government positions to only those who are actually qualified to carry out their duties, we see the federal government expand not only to carry out these new regulatory measures, but those responsible for ensuring these measures were legitimately carried out were actually qualified to do so. Years later, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, FDR comes along and significantly expands the size of the federal government once again. And we've talked about this extensively, not only in the federalism chapter, but also in the presidency chapter as well. So I'm not going to belabor the point too much here. If you need a refresher, um, just read the chapter in the book here. But what I think is most important to recognize is that FDR's New Deal really came to symbolize a defining moment when the federal bureaucracy metamorphosed into a critical social service provider. I mean, think about it, at the time, the idea of creating a government-funded pension program for all working Americans, aka Social Security, was a radical idea, and it continues to be one of the most controversial policies in American politics. Today, you can watch just about any campaign advertisement, and they almost always paint the opponent as someone who has vowed to slash Social Security benefits, um, and you have all of these fear politics. It's it's continues to be one of the biggest issues uh, in politics today. Fast forward a few more years later, and you've got President Johnson, who expanded the bureaucracy even more during the 1960s. Now, LBJ oversaw the massive expansion of social welfare programs that spanned areas like education, job training, the arts, the environment, and most importantly, voting and civil rights. This Great Society initiative attempted to revitalize the programs and efforts that were established by FDR's New Deal some 30 years prior. At this time, American society felt the pressure of an aging urban infrastructure and the coming of age of baby boomers seeking better education, employment, and living standards. Meanwhile, the civil rights movement raised awareness on the impact of discrimination on African American citizens, including those living outside the South. Finally, we get to the era of President Ronald Reagan, whose main goal is to reduce the size of government. Basically, from 1880 to 1980, that's over 100 years, the federal bureaucracy is growing and growing and growing. And as the number of services that that federal government provides increases, the amount of taxes that we pay is also increasing. So by the 1980s, people had become increasingly concerned about the effect of an increasingly large bureaucracy on American freedom and taxpayers' pocketbooks. And Reagan specifically campaigned on the agenda of reducing government and lowering taxes. And ever since then, the Republican Party uh, has really revolved around these critical issues, reducing government spending, reducing federal income tax, reducing the amount of regulation the government enforces on businesses and corporations, thus cutting costs. And this is where some of the major political cleavages in our society originate. Remember, at the beginning of the semester, we talked about what role the government should play in our lives. What should constitute a public good? What things should the government be responsible for providing its citizens? Should the government step in when unemployment is high and offer unemployed individuals money until they find a job? Should the government do something about exorbitant price gouging in the healthcare system and offer government-funded healthcare? Should the government provide its citizens with things like food stamps, social security, grants for college tuition? Uh, Americans disagree on the extent to which the government should do these things. And as we've witnessed throughout this lecture, those who are in charge, those who get to make the rules, those who decide who gets what, have a lot of power to shape the rules that affect all of us. But the scope of the bureaucracy, the amount of money it spends, and the amount of national debt our country has are very serious issues to all Americans. 
Today, there are 15 executive departments that employ about 1.7 million full-time federal workers. In 2019, the United States government spent about $4.7 trillion, that's providing services, public goods, grants, foreign development and aid, trade foundations, compensation for federal employees, everything. You can take a look at usaspending.gov, it's truly astonishing. At the same time, our country's national debt increases by about $50,000 every second. That's about what most Americans make in an entire year. Each minute, the debt increases by about $3 million. In an hour, you're up to $180 million. And after the span of just 24 hours, one full day, the debt has increased by over $4 billion. So these are some pretty scary, incomprehensible numbers. You can understand why so many Americans are skeptical or even opposed to the idea of the U.S. government taking on even more responsibility, like creating a Medicare for all plan, uh, which is why so many Americans find these plans so unpopular. And this is the challenge that our leaders face. This need or this impetus to cut spending from the federal government, but where do we make the cuts? You know, if we believe the government provides public goods because they are essential and necessary to everyday life, how do we decide which is more necessary or essential than the other? Now, a lot of people think that our government spends most of its money on national defense and the military, but that's actually not true. Here comes a good exam question. The Department of Health and Human Services consistently spends more money than any other executive department. Why? Well, when we break down what the Department of Health and Human Services actually does, it becomes pretty clear why they spend the most money. You've got Public Health, the Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Disease Control, Medicare, Medicaid, and the National Institutes for Health, and much more. Together, these services constitute about one and a quarter trillion dollars annually. So while most Americans agree that the federal government should reduce its spending, there's little agreement over which department should actually get the cuts. As you can see from the survey data here, there's not much of a consensus. So since cutting programs is generally unpopular with many Americans, several alternative solutions have been offered on how we can limit or reduce the size of the federal government, namely devolution and privatization. The idea behind devolution is that state governments can better and more efficiently provide services at the local level. For instance, when the welfare system was reformed in 1996 to assign the implementation of welfare services to the states, some states took the opportunity to design innovative programs that resulted in better services, whereas other states cut spending and reduced services. These state-level experiments resulted in the development of vastly different standards and outcomes. Consequently, the assistance available to low-income families varies greatly across the country. So in some states, the result has been better services than those provided at the national level, but in others, the result has been poorer service. So while devolution might have the desired effect of reducing national spending, it has the potential to create vast inequities across the country. Privatization is another strategy in which government services are provided to people through private contractors or businesses. The idea behind privatization is to allow private companies to compete with one another to provide a government service at the lowest cost. Again, this is one of the core tenets of libertarianism, that if private markets have the capacity to produce these goods better and more efficiently than the government, then they should be allowed to do so. But herein lies the debate between what constitutes better or not. So there's kind of a philosophical issue here, right? That we begin the beginning of the lecture with. Public goods are deemed necessary and vital to society. They are by definition non-rival and non-excludable. So when you adopt a privatization model and allow businesses to compete and make these goods rival, the motives shift from providing a good to earning a profit. This is precisely the type of problem that is manifested from the privatization of our criminal justice system. Let's consider for-profit prisons, for example. 
While there's debate around whether or not prison time should be punitive, meaning those incarcerated should be punished, or rehabilitative, I think most people would agree that our society would be better off if the criminally accused learned valuable skills while incarcerated to help them more easily reintegrate into society upon release. But you've probably heard this abundantly overused statistic before. The U.S. accounts for less than 5% of the world's total population, but constitutes nearly a quarter of the global prison population. So our government simply is not equipped and does not have the necessary resources to manage our country's incarceration epidemic. At least that's the argument for privatization. So in order to cut costs, many states have contracted out prisons to be managed by private companies. And what do private companies care most about? Providing a good or making a profit. So across the country, rehabilitation programs that used to exist in state-run prisons are gone in private for-profit prisons. Educational programs that used to exist in state prisons, gone. Libraries, gone. Basic health and mental services, all gone. And upon release, if you also happen to live in a state that has privatized probationary services, people become ensnared in a vicious cycle where they cannot afford the price of freedom. In some cases, not only are individuals left to pay their own court fees after release, but they also have to pay a monthly supervision fee to their parole officer, and even pay for their own drug test kits if they were convicted on drug-related charges. Unable to pay? Well, then it's back to jail. And when you get out, guess what? You have to pay even more fees. And in every way, these systems aren't designed to help people or provide a public good. It's to make a profit. So you can see how the privatization of certain sectors, especially those that interact with some of the most vulnerable of our society, can become incredibly dangerous. Think about the impact privatization might have in other sectors. I mean, we see a lot of it already with the healthcare system, which is why so many people want stricter government regulations. But what kind of consequences might arise if we privatize welfare or education? And to be quite honest, many states are already doing that. And so if this is something that you're interested in, there's a lot of research and literature and articles out there about the consequences of privatization. So in closing, while we might think the bureaucratic regulations are inefficient or wasteful or too far reaching, which is certainly the case in some instances, don't get me wrong, I think it's important to be aware of what types of consequences are produced by the alternatives like devolution and privatization. And hopefully the information presented in this lecture can help you navigate your own opinions about federal bureaucracy and the steps we should take collectively to help solve some of its problems. I hope you enjoyed this week's lecture. Our final lecture of the semester is on Monday regarding the judiciary. So until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and I will see you next week.